everybody, it's Romania Black, and I'm back from my break, ready to watch more Monster. <laughs> We're on episode seven. I rewatched uh, episode six uh, today and went back through my discussion because it had been about a week and a half since I'd watched uh, an episode of it, and so I wanted to get reacquainted with them. Um, what what a what a place to kind of um, leave off at. <laughs> As, as Timba is driving Nina back home, my theory is, is that they're all dead. That Johannes killed Moore and the parents and they're going to show up as the police show up or something and see everyone dead. And Timba's going to be like, what the hell? And Nina's going to be like, what the hell? And we, the audience, are going to be like, what the hell? So that's where I'm at. Um, I do have some comments that I want to talk about before we start this episode. Um, but real quick. I, I'm going to be very, very, very cautious on YouTube. There have been a couple people on YouTube that I've had some theories and I've said this repetitively to please don't confirm or deconfirm. And I've had a couple people be like, oh, don't worry, you'll find out about that theory later on. And I'm like, that is spoiling me. So I'm going to probably refrain from really delving too deep into YouTube comments right now until people can cool it. So I'm probably just going to do Patreon comments and because everybody on Patreon has been super respectful about that sort of thing right now. But please, I know it's hard. And this is a series that has so many twists and turns, but please don't spoil me. Don't give me hints or clues. We'll be like, you'll find out soon. Don't, don't tell me that because it ruins the surprise. And then my reaction is ruined. So I don't get to be excited about being surprised by the mystery and the twists and turns. So please don't do that. I, I don't want to get to the point where I can't read comments. But if people keep on trying to spoil me, I won't read your comments and I will just move on. So, and that kind of defeats the purpose of the channel. So what can I do? But I'm probably going to stick to Patreon comments for a while just to ease up until I feel like I can be trustworthy with some people in their comments. So just know that if I feel like I can trust you, I will answer your comments. But if you've not earned my trust, I'm going to be like, thanks, and then move on. So just be forewarned. But I do have some comments I do want to address because I felt like they're relevant before starting this episode. Um, CW talked about how stop signs may have said the word halt in Germany back in the 80s and 90s, but they weren't blue. <laughs> so they didn't know why the stop sign was blue. And I was like, I don't know either. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, Bella, as well as K.A., talked about how Johan's VA... Bella said that Johan's VA is the same voice actor as Mello from Death Note. And I was like... Oh, that's not a similar character, so that's kind of cool. But then K.A. added on to it and said that Johan's VA is also Yusuke from Yu Yu Hakusho. What? I was like, I watched Yu Yu Hakusho growing up, and I was like, Yusuke and Johan could not be more different. Well, you know, if Johan's a demon, then maybe. <laughs> maybe there's some similarities there. But I was like, personality-wise, they couldn't be more different. And I was like, holy cow. So yeah, I thought that was really, really cool. So thank you for that voice actor information. Um, Alex Cornejo talked about how Lunge notes that he hates the rain because it washes away evidence. And how, you know, maybe could it have washed away Tin Tinma's gun residue? I don't know. My crackpot theory that Tinma, at this point, do I think Tinma actually killed everybody? And this is like a beautiful mind scenario. I don't think so. But what I do think is that I think Johan is trying to frame Tinma for the murders, for whatever reason, because he's a monster and he's trying to frame Tinma for everything because every all the pieces of the puzzle are lining up that you, if you were Lunge, you could easily see how, yeah, Tinma could have done all these things. We as the audience know that he hasn't, but it could be that Johan is trying to frame him. And so that very well could be the case. I don't know. I guess we'll see. But please don't confirm, deconfirm, or be like, oh, you'll find out eventually. Please don't do that. Just, uh, there was a couple comments on YouTube. I was like, oh, don't look, because I was afraid I was going to get spoiled by something. But I thought that was really, really good for Alex Pernagio to note. And then the idea that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, Tenma is intending to do this good. I Honestly, I don't really know what Tenma is planning on doing at this point. When he catches up with Johan, is he going to try to reform him? Is he going to be like Junkers and try to sit down and talk with him and be like, you shouldn't be a mass murderer? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, what is Tenma going to do with him? That's the question. He's on this mission to find Johan. And a part of me feels like he's going to try to do like with Junkers and try to make him change the air, see the errors of his ways. But I'm like, Tenma, that's very naive. 
and very idealistic and, and puts a lot of ego on, on Tenma, if that's the case, that he would be capable of changing a mass murderer's mindset like that. But I don't know. I'm very curious to see if Johan catches up with, with if Tenma catches up with Johan, what's going to happen with that. So we'll see. Um, and then finally, AJN talked about how th with episode five, the comment about the World War II uh, German combatants and post-war communists in East Germany, that it's something to maybe keep track of throughout the series. And again, I don't want spoilers, hints, or clues, but that's pretty vague. So, okay. I just, I know everybody's trying to help me, but I'm like, I want to go in as blind as possible. And so I get really worried because I feel like people are trying to steer me in a direction with comments to make me think a certain way. And I'm like, I want to be surprised. I want my discussions to be natural and not really, and not really influenced by other people's things unless it's a comment afterwards that can lead into the next discussion if that makes sense but we'll see so i i'm kind of all jacked up on coffee to be honest i'm like hyped up on adrenaline and stuff and it doesn't help me that i poured another cup so i'm being quite self-destructive in my own means but i'm so energized right now ready to watch this episode i'm like i'm all jacked up ready to go so we'll see i i've been curious i've been wondering the entire holiday break i'm like okay what is going to happen? And my theory is they're going to show back up at that house and more sadly will be dead as will be the foster parents. And then the police will show up and there's Tenma with Nina saying that he was rescuing her. But, and honestly with the email, how is she to think that it wasn't Tenma that was sending it because he's been researching her. So again, if everything, all the evidence, if, if Johan is trying to frame Tenma, it all would make sense because I could see how Longe would find all the breadcrumbs to lead to that conclusion. The question is, why would Yonge, why would Johan frame Tenma? What's going on? There's so many questions. And I'm very eager to find out what the answers are. So with that being said, I hope you all enjoy this reaction and discussion, but let's not waste any more time. We are going to start episode seven of Monster, and we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's go. Well, <laughs> this episode like got right in the thick of it. Yeah. Um, holy crap. So <laughs> I, man, as soon as Timma went into town, I was like, I wonder if Nina is going to like flip, flew the coop and she flew the coop. So it's like, come on, girl. Come on, girl. But that leaves, oh God, that leaves a lot of issues of what is Tim going to do? Oh my gosh, this episode. R.I.P. to Moore and the Fortners. R.I.P. The scary thing about this is the fact that we now know that Johan is not only capable of murdering these people himself, but is also capable of enlisting people from the inside to do things for him. Like we've seen so far, we've seen so far that Johan has had a pretty strong hold on several people, right? So we know that Johan has had a hold on Yunkers. He got him to go back to the building. He's had a hand in influencing the two detectives. He's had a hand in influencing the old man. Like, like Johan has found a way to manipulate people being creepy as hell, so can't imagine why, but he's clearly able to manipulate people. And he has, I would put Johan and Tim up here because kind of the things that they're doing. Johan, he has inside connections, right? In this case, it's with the Mannheim, the Mannheim police. Okay. Now, the good thing is Lungay does not seem to be associated with any of that. Lungay is kind of acting on his own and is doing his own private detective work and is like trying to piece together everything himself. So, but that's interesting. And I'm wondering, God, I wanted to go through, I, I was debating bringing Whiteboard Coon out because I didn't know if I would need Whiteboard Coon. But then I was like, we need to go through and piece together all of the ways in which Tinma could be suspected for these crimes, we, the audience, know that Tinma's not committing them, as far as we know, but we don't know for sure. So it's like, oh my god, like, so, okay, I wanted to have Tinma, Tinma Theory 1, which we'll put, like, 1 here, 
which is the idea that Tenma is in fact innocent and that Johan is manipulating things. Put here, there is a, I'm gonna make my arrow nice and bold here, that Johan is uh, manipulating, manipulating and framing Tenma. Okay. And then we're gonna have Tenma uh, squared. <laughs> We're going to have Tim squared, and the idea of Tim squared is the fact that he actually is causing these things, right? Which is kind of crazy because it could be like the monster at the very end splitting up into the Tinma that is innocent being framed or the Tinma that is committing the crimes. Who knows? Again, I don't want confirmation, and please do not be like, oh, you'll find out, you know, soon. Don't tell me that, please. I, I know people try to help me, and I appreciate it so much, but my brain, I'm I'm not dumb, and so I start to piece things together, and then I'm like, oh, well, I figured that out, and I don't want to do that with the series. I want to be surprised, but there was a lot of surprises in this episode. There were some things that weren't surprising, but other things that I was like, oh, the fact that Johan, the fact that Johan has police officers under, in, under his wing in some capacity is quite troubling right and I, I feel like the blood on the one guy's coat is in this column is in this Timma's favor right because he notices the blood on the coat now could that blood be from something unrelated it could be but I, we don't know the guy looked awfully suspicious he looked awfully freaked out so what do we do in this but her saying she's not Anna I'm Nina and he's like when you were brought into my hospital you were Anna and your brother was Johan. And she like just freaks the hell out when she realizes that he's Johan. She like pieces it all together and starts remembering him. Like that image of her looking absolutely terrified. It, it's pretty grisly. I'm not going to lie. The facial expressions in this are just something else. So, all right, we're going to get back to past the intro even though I like the intro. House of Tragedy. I was saying this in the reaction. I honestly, um, the way that Anthony has set up these files for me to watch, I don't know the titles of the episode when I open them up. I, it just says Monster 5, Monster 6, Monster 7. That's all it says. So when I open the file until I watch the episode, I don't know the title of it, which I love. I love kind of figuring it out as we go. Yeah, House of Tragedy. And I'm not watching the previews, so it's like, what are we going to get? But yeah, the moment they show up in the house and the lights are off, I'm like, red flag one through three already. And him knocking on the door asking for them. And so I like that Tinma's, Tinma is getting more and more aware of what's going on. And he's picking up on cues and things that don't make sense. Tinma starts out the series extremely naive and extremely idealistic and he's just like everything's fine it's like no and so what I like about this episode is that we start to see Tenma working through the situation and working through and asking questions and thinking about things and being like okay this doesn't feel right what's wrong with it and and kind of coming to these deductions himself which I like but he figures out he's like wait a minute he was supposed to call the police why aren't they here waiting on us what's up and he goes back to Moore saying, I'll call the police from here. And he's like, okay, nobody's home. The lights are out. This is not a good thing. And he's like, nobody's here. And this, this entire episode and this entire series, it's like a horror film because it's so creepy. There's this like ominous, this ominous isolation and loneliness to it, right? Where when Timma looks out onto the street, it's just the car. There's no one else there. It's that just being alone that's scary. And because there's no one but Nina there and she's so quiet, that quiet becomes eerie. And it's like, it's just the atmosphere of this episode. It's crazy, right? And he's like, it doesn't look like the police ever came here. And so you can tell he's like, I don't want things bad to happen, but the fact that the lights are on, the door is open, and then, yeah, we see the cake, and just, like, the, the single, the single doorway with the light shining through. Mm -mm. Like, all, I'm not a horror movie fan. I'm easily scared. So, the fact that this stuff is, like, straight out of a horror film, I was like, mm-mm. But you know the minute they open that door, those people are dead. And, yeah, they walk in and see... Yeah. And then there's the cake that fell on the ground, the photo frame, 
the cigarettes and the three of them are dead. Oh my God. It's just so horrific. Yeah. And it's, I, I'm guessing their throats have been slit, but all three of them died like at once. So how, how, again, kind of like what the detective was saying, what Lungay was saying is that there had to be multiple, multiple killers at once. And Junkers has said that he employed, that Johan employed him and his friends to do his dirty work. So he had multiple people able to kill all at once. It's like, yep, that was clearly what happened. I just, God, the way that it pans out and shows them all, it's so freaky. So freaky. But yeah, as I'm taking a photo of it. But yeah, but this is just, and then of course, Tim goes to reach for a pulse. It's not there. And him, just the idea of him crawling on his hands and knees to get to them is, it's so unsettling, right? But him going there, going up to the dad and seeing, and he even like tries to do mouth to mouth. This is, this is the most morbid thing. <laughs> it's the most morbid joke and I'm going straight to Hades in a handbasket for saying it. But for a split second, I was like, is he going to do mouth to mouth on more? I was like, it's the darkest joke. Nope. Not going there. Curse me for that. But he doesn't. He does not give mouth to mouth to more. He does the dad. But then more he realizes is already dead. And he just, he begs him to live. And he says, come back to life. And it's so tragic because he's just sitting there trying. And then he goes over to Moore with the cigarettes. And the moment he like tries to place a cigarette in his mouth, I'm like, Timma has just lost it. But he's keeping composure as he's about to cry. Oh my gosh. It's awful. Where he's just sitting there like, like just asking him to live and the cigarette falling out of his mouth. Mm -mm. And that's when Nina or Anna or whatever her name is, when she remembers, she's like, I killed him. And he's like, are you serious? As he's like, oh my God. And realizes when she said, kill me, she said, kill me because she shot her brother. Mm hmm. And he goes up to her and she's like, I, I shot him. Yep. And about, and she like collapses about that time. And poor Tim was like, okay, what do we do in this situation? He's like, I brought him back to life. He's like, yep, I, yep, you killed your brother and I brought him back and here we are. Oh my gosh. So at this point, he gets Nina up and like moves her over and goes to touch the phone, right? And realizes that the phone is dead. Mm -hmm. The phone line's been cut. He's like, we've got to get away from here. So at this point, Tinma, if we backtrack to episode six, if we backtrack to last episode, what Lunge discovers is that Tinma's tie, Tinma's tie was used to tie up the man killed. That's problematic. I was like, oh no. L Lungay's like, wow, this is Tinma's tie. We can dust it for prints. We can find out whose it is. It, it would have his fingerprints on it, right? Yikes. And so that could definitely be used to tie up the man who was apparently killed. Now, at this point, we think the man was killed by Johan, right? That's what we suspect. What if Johan's like, Tinma hired me to kill him? How are we to know otherwise, right? So did Tinma orchestrate, did he orchestrate the, the gardener's death? Because they asked where the rope was that tied up the hands and they're like, ah, no. Because they said that the murders happened at the same time. That's what makes it creepy. The fact that the murders happened at the same time. Well, if we're going with this, the logical thing, it could be that Johan had the detectives kill the parents and more while Johan killed the gardener. That's theory one. Theory two would be that Johan killed the parents while Tinma killed the gardener. I, there's, there's so much that's left up to questioning <clears throat> that we're not exactly sure about, right? Of course, Lungay to Lungay, it looks like he could have 
used, it was his tie, he could have orchestrated the death of the gardener. As far as Lunge knows, right? He doesn't know what exactly happened there. And so the thing of it is, too, that Tinma's prints, his prints are on the phone and on all three bodies. They're on everything. They're on, they're on, they're at the door, they're on the phone, they're on all three of the bodies. So Lungay, if, if like a hair that falls off because he's growing his hair out, if a hair fell off onto one of their clothing, they could trace that and look at it. I don't know exactly how detailed forensics were back in the early 90s, if how much they could do with that, like they can now, but with forensic analysis, but there's a lot of implications. They could dust for prints and find out that, that Tim was attached. But not only that, between both stories, it's the idea that Tinma, that Tinma had knew and researched Nina's home. They, they could have the newspaper show that, yeah, this guy was here researching Nina Fortner, went to her house and she disappeared and the parents died along with the editor that helped him research. That looks suspicious, right? That all looks suspicious. And we, the audience, know that this whole thing has been messed up and that Johan's kind of orchestrated a lot of it. But for Lunge, nah, it looks really suspect that this guy just showed up, did this research, and now everyone attached to him and the research is dead and Nina's gone. Seems rather curious. But man, these cops, these cops showing up, I... Uh, it's so crazy because something automatically seems wrong, right? Because you had Muller and Mesner show up and something is off the moment they walk through the door, right? But you see police you, and you think for a split second, oh, yeah, Moore got the call in. But then when you think about it for two seconds, you're like, wait, the line was cut. How could he make the call? And it's like, no, Johan called them in. He called them in to go there and stake out and wait for Timma to show up. And then because they act the most chillest as possible, they just walk in, look at the bodies and go, huh, well, isn't that terrible? You guys want to go on a ride with us? I'm like, you bypassed like seven steps. You didn't even check for evidence. You didn't check for like vitals. You didn't call an ambulance. You didn't like ask them what happened. You didn't question them there on the scene. You're like, none of that. They were just banking on the fact that Tinma and Nina were so in shock that they're like, oh, well, we'll get help here soon. You come with us. They'll take care of the scene. You guys come with us and we'll, we'll hear your stories down at headquarters. And it's like, no, you should, you should not have just done that. He's like, no. And then the guy asked, Mesner said, is she the victim's daughter? Because they're looking for the girl. They want Nina. So them asking him if she's it is important to the whole thing. Oh my gosh. And they're like, poor thing. Oh my God. And she's just like in shock. And Tinma's there trying to be supportive for her. But he notices that he's like, because they're like to think something could happen in such a peaceful town. And the one guy, Mesner, looks like his body language, like he just looks freaked out, like he's seen a ghost. Highly suspect. And he's like, where are you from, China? And it's like, no, I'm Japanese. My name is Tinma. And he's like, oh, you're Japanese. What a terrible experience for you in such a faraway land. Uh, it's just, oh my God. And she's just sitting there shaking. And then that's when he realizes, he's like, oh yeah, you're all right now, except she's not. And he realizes that they're not going towards Heidelberg. They're leaving there. And he's like, where are we going? He's like, oh, we're going to Mannheim. Mannerheim. And he's like, oh, okay. And that's when he looks down and sees the blood. He's like, they said they got a call. And he's like, they came because they got a call, but there was no phone line to call from. So he's like, who, who got them to come? And then he notices the blood on his jacket and there was no sirens. So it's like, what do we do? Would the P police whisk away without first securing the scene? No, they would not. And, and they're banking on the fact that Tinma and Nina were so shell shocked that they could just whisk them away. But if Tinma, it's so frustrating because it's like if Tinma had thought Again, what could he have done? I guess he could have ran off with her. I don't know what else they could have done in the moment, but it's so frustrating because we, the audience, are kind of put in the same position that Tinma is. If we had taken an extra second 
and thought about the situation would be like, whoa, wait, there's like 10 red flags here. Why did we do this, this, and this? This is wrong. But it kind of, the episode catches you up in the moment and you just go, oh yeah, the police is here. Okay, sure. And then the more you think about it, you're like, no, this is not good. He's like, the police IDs looked authentic. And they are, but that's the thing. And then the blood on there, uh uh-huh. Oh my God, the blood on the coat. And he's like, could they have been the ones that killed him? And Tim was like, what do I do? Do I get out of this moving vehicle? How do I solve this problem? And then they find a roadblock. Thank God there's a police roadblock. But the police know who they are. And he's like, oh, I need to get some fresh air with her. And he's like, what do I do? He's like, they're real detectives. So where should we go? And then that, at that point, that's when they call. That's when they make a mistake. The detectives say, oh, is everything all right, Dr. Tenma? And Tim was like, I didn't tell you I was a doctor. That was like, that was such a shock. I was like, oh my gosh, no. Uh." He's like, how do you know who I am? He says, how did you know? I gave you my name, but I didn't tell you I was a doctor. How did you know that? And the one guy, they both mess up and they both realize it. And the look on his face, they run after him. And that's when he takes off and goes across the bridge with her. Yep. So he goes in town and gets her some stuff, some clothes, some bread, some sausage, some cheese, and some coffee. She's clearly not a big coffee drinker. And they find this shack and she goes and changes. And then she comes out. And But before she comes out, she tells a story, right? And so she says there were lots of dead people. She says there were lots of dead people. Is how she starts out, which is a great way to start out any story. Definitely gets your audience's attention. And she says, my brother and I walked among them, just the two of us. Okay. And Johan and Nina were among them. Okay. And she says that it was like we were the only people left in the world. And he's like, well, when, where was that? What, what's going on? And she says, we crossed the border and a man and his wife cheered us up. So they crossed the border. I'm assuming it was between East and West Germany, but we don't know that for sure. It's not directly established. They were so kind to us. Then my brother said he had a good plan. Mm. Not long after that, the man and his wife died. And so there, this family was kind. And the brother had a good plan. And they died. Basically, he killed them, right? And so she establishes that this kept on happening. She says, everyone who's ever been nice to us all die. She's like, I don't understand. She's like, one day I discovered the reason why, and it was because of him. And then she remembers. I love that. I love the shot of her, like, with her hand, like, the gun. And she described, like, when he killed the, the, Lieb, the Lieben family. He's like, he told her, and he laughed as he said it, after you shoot me, throw the gun outside. Because, yeah, the night night that they found her and him on the ground, the gun was thrown out the window. It looked like the window was broken, but it was like, was somebody shot from the outside? But no, it was the fact that she threw the gun out the window because he told her to. And he says, be sure to shoot me in the head. I'm like, why? So, yeah, he told her to throw the gun out. Throw the gun out. And shoot him in the head. Ah! There's so much there. It's like, there's so much there to unpack. It's like, what do we do? 
It's like, did he know that? Did he know that Timo was going to operate on him? Did he? Did he foresee it? Was it like a prophecy? Did he tell her to shoot him in the head? What if she hadn't shot him in the head? What if she shot him in the heart or the leg or the gut? What, what would we have done then? What would have happened? I there's so much mystery there. And he's like, why did he tell her to throw the gun outside? Why didn't he? Why you know he didn't want her implicated? It sounds like he didn't want her to be. He didn't want her to get caught and be accused but then i guess throwing it outside in the rain would have washed away the evidence the fingerprints so that could have been it but like what do we do with this there's so many questions about that and tim was like oh my god and she says i shot him like he said and i aimed for his head she's like why did you save him yeah, and her question, like, why did you save him? But the answer to that is so hard because it's like he didn't know any of this. He was just being a doctor and saving lives. And and there's a several moments in this episode where Tim kind of turns his head and he's like, I don't know how to give you an answer. Like, what do I say, right? And she's like, why did you save him? All these people have died because he was brought back to life. Okay. And so Timba realizes, he's like, okay, we need, we can't stay here. We've got to go somewhere, but we can't go to Mannerheim because if those guys are actual detectives, then, then we're, then someone in the police hop, in the police office is Amal and Jonah on Johan's side. And so he tells her that Johan's trying to take her away and that she needs to survive and carry on for the future, Right. And so meanwhile, after that, he decides to go up and check on things and see how things are going in town. And all the reporters, it's this big case though, right? And it's kind of like a commentary that there's this big high profile murder because yeah, it's such a juicy story. You've got this pretty girl with blonde hair. Her par- her parents have died. This news reporter somehow included in it and he's dead. She's missing. It's like such juicy gossip, this story, right? It, it's, it makes you wonder because it doesn't seem like the other couples had nearly as much press surrounding them, but this case, for some reason, does. And it's almost like, you almost wonder if Johan's influencing, like, the media, if he's got people in the newspapers, he's got people in the police, so it creates a sense of paranoia where you're like, you don't know, like, where does Johan have his fingers dabbled in, right? Because Johan's a beautiful man who seems very calm on the surface, so who's to say he doesn't have influences all throughout this country in different areas? So... It's really scary, and I I really want Timma to go there and talk to Lunge, but then the detectives show up, right? And so then Timma finds out the guy was murdered at the castle, and he sees, and God, he gets so close, but then the detectives show up, and they go to talk about things inside, and Timma's like, what should I do? I need to do something, but everything is all connected, right? And it's, that's when he says he offers to meet there at five, and they say, we have to find the Japanese guy who's with more. He knows something. Okay. And that's when this guy goes to the post. And he says, I'm, I'll bring an important witness to your office at five. Don't let the police know. So the question is, is Timma going to go in at five o'clock? Is he going to go in or not? Right? What's going to happen? Hmm. Is he going to actually show up at the police post or not? Especially since Nina's gone. What are we going to do? Because was he going to bring Nina with him? I'm assuming he was. And so we have this thing about the post. I can't read the German headline, but he looks down and sees more. It's so sad when he hugged more and like tried to put the damn cigarette in his mouth. He was a really nice guy. Dang it. And so then Lunge shows up and they're like, you shouldn't be here without permission. Besides, you're here from the federal police to investigate the killings of the middle-aged couples, aren't you? So we only have files on the killing at the castle here. So yeah, Lunge snuck in to to view the kill to view the file on the killing at the castle. He's just using the the other murders as a disguise, right? As a a lead to get him in, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh no. He's like, oh well. He's like, something was bothering me. So sorry. He's like, the case you're looking at and this one happened at the same time. It couldn't be the same perpetrator. Except it could. Could be the same party, just not the same perpetrator. 
And so, like, the guy, their sign says, hands had been tied. Mm-hmm. Did you find the rope nearby? No. It had been removed by the time the victim was found. So, at some point, Johan took the tie off and discarded it, right? So, we think. We think Johan, because Johan showed up while the gardener was tied up to kill him. And I'm assuming took the tie off and discarded it. But Why? That's a big question. Why would Johan have taken the tie off and discarded it? That's one thing that kind of rings weird in this. Like, you would think if Johan was trying to implicate and get Timma accused of the murders, you'd have left the tie on because that would have been a big flag towards Timma. But they took it off and discarded it. So why? Hmm. That's very curious. And he's like, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the castle goes up to see where everything took place. I love Lungay. Lungay just shows up. He's super stoic and he's just like, we'll just see what happens and does his thing, right? And then as he's leaving, he makes note, of course, typing to himself so he can remember it, saying there are four routes to escape from the scene. He had to consider whether he'd be hidden from sight. How crowded the area was where he'd come out. And the locations of the lights. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, then he investigates. Of course, he puts the gloves on because he's an actual detective and doesn't touch everything with his damn hands like Tinma. He actually puts the gloves on to hide the fingerprints and looks in the bushes, and that's when he sees it. And he manages to find it. That lucky bastard. Yep. Found it. Oof. Oh my gosh. So yeah, so Timma's got his tie at Heidelberg Castle. So there's that. There's the idea that he knew and researched Nina's home. So they could, and the email was from a seemingly anonymous address. Right? Okay. And so then there's the idea that Tinma has been evading the law. That's not suspicious at all. The idea that Yunkers, the idea is that Yunkers and him were in the same building, but Johan walked away. That's probably the most damning thing is that Tinma let Johan walk away that night that Yunkers died. He let him go. And so it's kind of like, but why'd you do that? Why didn't you try to stop him? And it's like, ugh. And then Yunkers and him being in the same building as him. So there's that, right? And then there's the idea of the fingerprints being on the phone, books, everything, right? And the fact that Nina, Nina disappears next to a lake um, without Tinma. Now, my, my, like, morbid crackpot theory would be that Tinma killed Nina and discarded her in the lake. That'd be, my, like, my morbid theory. But I don't think that's happened at all. That's, like, that's, like, the morbid crack theory of Tinma's really the bad guy in all this. And I don't think that's true. But I just wanted to point it out there being, like, that's the extreme crackpot theory. But I think she left because she freaked out and she was, like, mm-mm. But the, the thing of it is, even the letter itself is kind of, the letter is kind of interesting because the letter clears Tinma of blame from the victim. The letter says, oh, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You were a doctor. You were just saving lives. So keep on saving lives, I guess, and do what you got to do, right? Because when he finds the letter, we see the thermos and the two sandwiches. He left the two sandwiches there. And says, Dr. Timma, it wasn't your fault. You just did what you had to do as a doctor. It wasn't your fault. Like, just iterating that. Iterating that it wasn't his fault. He was right. Right? And saying, please eat the sandwiches and get some rest. I want you to survive. And save as many people as you can. Which is kind of a crazy thing because she went from, she went from a few conversations ago saying, 
you know, why did you save him? And say, and seeming like saving him was a bad thing to telling him in the letter, make sure to save as many as you can. Uh, on the surface, that's just, it feels weird. And it feels like, why would she have left him that letter? It's like, why would she have said those specific words? Because she believed his actions were a mistake. So this letter that she left pretty much absolves him of all guilt being like, well, well, this is the victim speaking and yes, my, you know, foster parents are dead and all this, but it wasn't your fault. You saved my brother who's a horrible monster and a serial killer, but just keep on saving lives. <laughs> Hopefully you'll never save any more serial killers. It, it's just a weird letter, the way that it's worded, right? Something just feels so off about it and I can't place it, but this, and then he says, Lena Fortner. And he eats the sandwich and starts to cry. And yeah, and, but it's so, it's just such a creepy, a creepy scene. It's just such a creepy moment because it's like, she left him the letter, didn't say where she was going, didn't say anything about what she was going to do. She just left him the two sandwiches and the coffee and said, you, you're a good person, keep on doing, keep on keeping on, and then disappeared. So it, there's something so suspicious about it. And again, just like he did in the rain with Yunkers, he crouches down crying. So it's, it's, I don't believe that Tim was a murderer, and I don't believe Tim was the bad guy, but this show makes you question things. It makes you question things, because he did the same thing, like his actions where he crouched, Crouched after the death of Yunkers and the disappearance of Nina. I'm like, where's Nina going to go? What's she going to do? How is she going to evade her brother? Is she going to, like he said, is she going to try to kill him? What do we do with that? Lunga is on the case trying to figure stuff out. What do we do about that? He's like, what do you intend to do, Nina? I brought him back to life. That monster. I. That just that line where he's like, I brought him back to life. That monster. I. Like me. So again, there's that question of is Johan the monster or is Tinma the monster? What do we do with that? Right? What do we do with that? And he's just on his way trying to figure out what to do. I brought him back to life. Hmm. So yeah, there's there's lots of things attached to that, like the guilt, like Tenma feeling guilty for bringing him back, for saving him, for causing all this pain to Nina. Nina's gone MIA. What are we doing about her? Where'd she go in all this? How do we know that Johan's not going to catch her like in five seconds? What do we do with that? The idea that Tenma has all this stuff stacked against him. The, the timing of everything, his location and all of this, it would be so easy for Johan to frame Timma for these crimes because there's so much that Timma has a hand in. The only thing that saves him from being completely guilty is that we, the audience, are seeing what's happening with him in real time. And because we know Johan exists, and there's that. <laughs> but what do we do about it? Uh, so, uh, what do we do about it? Oh my gosh. I feel like this episode was very fast paced and like went through the motions really quickly, right? Super quickly. And I feel bad. Like, I feel like there's more I want to discuss, but it's just, it's just leading back to the same questions. Like Johan, we didn't see him at all this episode, but we felt his presence, right? We felt his presence. So it's like, what do we do about that? Nina, like how much of what Nina says is the truth? You know, she had a spotty memory. Like, is everything she's remembering 100% accurate? The, the question about where they came from, there were lots of dead people. And then they found this kind family. And then, like, are, are they both really monsters? And did they find all these? And they said they crossed the border. Well, the, it's the, you know, there's that supernatural element, right? So realistically, if you're thinking realistically, it's like, did they cross the border from like East Germany to West Germany, from another country into Germany, and they were coming from like a war zone or coming from an area where there'd been a lot of violence or a bombing, and they were all those dead bodies and they survived somehow. And then that doesn't explain why Johan 
wanted to kill the family, other than the fact that he might be a psychopath, doesn't explain that, but it explains, like, where they came from. That's the more realistic way. And then, like, the, the supernatural going along with the fairy tale pictures at the end, that version of my story, that version of my brain is like, okay, well, maybe Anna and Johan are, like, demons and came from, like, the other side, crossed the border into the mortal realm, and then Johan's like, I've got a great idea, and starts killing people. Maybe that's the case, if I'm going, like, the supernatural route. But this show so far has been very realistic, so... I, I keep thinking there's going to be, since it's an anime, there's going to be like a supernatural element and there's not been. So I'm probably just like thinking way, way, way outside the box, but don't confirm or deconfirm. Let me, let me wallow in my mystical land over here while we figure out what's actually going to happen. So I, I'm 90% sure that there's no supernatural elements of this show. It's just creepy and has horror elements and it's more along the lines of something tied to realism, like they came from like a war-torn area and Johan was affected by it and killed people as a result. And because he might've been a psychopath, we don't know for sure. But I, I feel 90% sure there's no supernatural element going to be in this show. But there's that 10% that pops up that I'm like, ah, I just don't know. And this show makes you question it and I love it for it, but it, it definitely leaves you with a lot of questions of, okay, what do we do with this? Where do we go to from here? So I, and I don't know the answer. So, hmm. but yeah, lots of things to think about. What is Tenma gonna do? What is Lungi gonna do? What is Nina going to do? And what is Johan gonna do to try to complicate this story even further? So I, I thank you all so much for being so kind and supportive. And I hope you all enjoyed this discussion and reaction again. I appreciate all of your comments. I know you all are sitting there on your hands, hands and mouth being like Romania, ah, but I appreciate your patience and I'm sorry if I come off as ranting in these videos, but I, I'm loving being surprised by this series and I want to keep that going. We got a long way to go with this series and I want to keep being surprised. So we'll see. But uh, in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care and yeah, I'll be back next week with episode eight of Monster. Bye.